Feast of Pentecost, and then again broke up his flames of fire, and then uh, uh, dwelt above each one of them, and then rested upon them, showing the visible manifestation of the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And so we continue that, and then we're going to get into some very important doctrines starting tonight, and then going over the next few uh, lessons And uh, there's a lot of doctrines we could really get into, as you know, Uh, but certainly we could do the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which would take us years, okay, but we're not going to do that. But we are going to talk about the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because this is called the baptism of the Spirit by Jesus back in Acts chapter 1, but we also know it as the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And even though they are somewhat synonymous terms and talking about the same, you know, uh, uh, process of the Holy Spirit entering into the believer, they actually have two different things uh, based on what the Word of God tells us about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then as we're also going to see tonight, we're going to talk about the filling of God the Holy Spirit because that word is used as well. So there's really three main doctrines regarding the Holy Spirit that we're going to be noting over the next couple of sessions uh, that we're together. But tonight, let's go back and uh, finish up uh, some of the exegesis that gets us into those doctrines and uh, understanding more of the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit that happened uh, at the beginning of the church age. So in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there we had uh, a couple of interesting uh, uh, analogies based on the Greek that is given to us here. That noise, like the violent rushing wind, how it talked about an army that is suddenly coming up upon its enemy, and uh, then in the attack mode, and how the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit has been designed to establish a Christian army of Christian warriors, Christian soldiers, to be victorious and really fight inside the angelic conflict. Again, this isn't a Christian uh, uh, warriors and Christian army to fight governments, okay? Don't get that wrong, okay? We're here to fight against the unseen forces of the evil one and therefore giving us guidance and protection over our own souls and then help other people for their guidance and protection over their souls as well so they aren't defeated by the evil one. All right, then it also said, fill the whole house where they were sitting. And there we had two Greek words, uh, one talking about the home, the dwelling place, and then even that word sitting talks about where they reside. So there's a double emphasis there of this being the new home of God the Holy Spirit. And from that, what we've studied already is that we are built into the temple of God based on the indwelling ministry of God the Holy Spirit. Then as it says in verse 3, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. The word for tongues there is glossa, as we noted. That also can mean languages, as it then is used down in verse 4, where they spoke in foreign languages that they had never learned for the first time. But here it's just talking about a description of what these flames of fire look like. Again, and and, uh, don't lose the fact that God described those flames of fire as tongues of fire. So then he could also go to say now they learn languages based on that fire that looked like a language atop of them. Okay, So again, the tongue of fire is giving them the understanding of the Holy Spirit coming into them. And therefore, when they were able to speak in foreign languages, it's by the power of God the Holy Spirit. So again, uh, don't lose that uh, 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 connection in regard to what this definition is all about. So again, verse 3, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, or tongues it says there, glossa is the Greek word, this time it's languages, as the Spirit was giving them Utterances, And we talked about that. All the people from uh, uh, all around the world, were, uh, Jews, were coming into Jerusalem. They had their own native languages, and these disciples were able to speak to them in their own native languages rather than just speaking in the, the uh, really it was Aramaic at that point in time, but very similar to e- uh, Hebrew, as we know. 
So in any case, in Acts chapter 2, verse 3, this is where we left it off on Tuesday night, where we see the visible manifestation. In verse 2, it was a, 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 a auditory manifestation, the sound of the rushing wind. And maybe they even felt the wind too, but at least it was described to us as a noise that not only the room could hear, but also the, probably the whole city could hear it as well. And then we see the visible manifestation where they actually saw these flames of fire and then how each one touched upon their head. And again, I uh, uh, grabbed this picture off the Internet, which gives us a good rendition of what that might have looked like. But they all were in the room and they all had little flames of fire up on top of their heads that were just sitting upon them. And then ultimately, you know, that would disappear into them giving them the visible manifestation of the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. Very similar to when Jesus Christ was baptized after his uh, baptism by John, where again they saw the dove descending from heaven and then entering into Jesus. And that was a visible manifestation of the humanity of Jesus Christ receiving God the Holy Spirit, where he was the prototype for the spiritual life of the church age, and therefore he received that indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And as it, we know from the Bible, even though he was God, he did not use his own deified functions to solve his problems, but yet as God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who keeps the heavens and the earth in their right order and all things going properly, he continued to do that from his deity, but while he was here in humanity as well, he was doing that, but he didn't use that deity to solve his own problems. Instead, he relied upon the same power that we have, the Word, with the power and the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So now these individuals are getting God the Holy Spirit. They too are being empowered and enabled by that Holy Spirit to not only know the Word of God like they never knew before, but also with the unique spiritual gifts that were given to them to give uh, 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 understanding that these men were from God. And what they were doing could only be empowered by God. And that's exactly what was demonstrated uh, in this event. So where we left it off is that the tongues of fire went to each one of them and that were in the room, and they rested on each of them. Again, kathizo is that Greek word. We saw kathamai earlier. Similar words, cognate words, but again, sat down, but it also can mean appointed. And that is an important word and utilization of this word here where it talks about you and I are appointed by God to do certain things within our lives. It talks about our predestination from eternity past. It talks about our election from eternity past. Where God looked down the whole corridors of history, knew that you would be positive towards Jesus Christ, and therefore appointed you to be elected into the royal family of God. And with that, you have a pre-designed plan that God has designed for your life. You've been appointed to execute that plan by God. And so therefore, this power of the Holy Spirit coming into them didn't just sit down on them, but it also recognizes that they were appointed by God the Holy Spirit, really God the Father and in, in the Son in Trinity, but appointed to this great mission and ministry that each one of them would have. <clears throat> so ultimately, this word also is used figuratively for assigning work, placing people in positions of authority, and it symbolizes that authority from which judgment and wisdom were given. So in the Greek language outside of the Bible, this is how that word, uh, uh, kathizo, was utilized. So again, we see more of the emphasis of the role responsibility that the Holy Spirit was now giving to these individuals, believers of the church age, as he does for us too, so that ultimately they would go forward in the plan of God with power and authority to execute God's plan, to wield the word of God by learning it and then applying it, and then to execute judgment and wisdom in all kinds of situations. And it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, I uh, had a conversation with uh, uh, somebody last week and they talked about, you know, uh, uh, you know, are we supposed to judge people again? Are we supposed to judge? And, you know, what's the right type of judging? What's the wrong type of judging? All that kind of stuff. And it's kind of interesting from the Bible because it says, you know, do not judge your brother. 
you know, take the log out of your own eye before, before you take the speck out of their eye, okay? So there, it's a negative aspect of judging that we are not to do. Where we don't run around and say, oh, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, when we've got our own problems and idiosyncrasies and all kinds of issues that we deal with each and every day that we're blind to most of the time. But yet, yet we're quick to point out the wrong and the, the, uh, the inaccuracies of other people very quickly. But there is a right kind of judging that we are to do. And that's the type of judging where you have the Word of God in your soul, you know what is right, you know what is wrong, and therefore you can make a judgment as to what's happening around you as to what is right and what is wrong. And you can even have the appropriate uh, 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 understanding of your fellow brother or sister as to whether they're doing right or wrong and bring that to their attention. But you don't do it with your brow beating and pointing of the finger type of arrogant, you know, legalistic, I'm better than you type of issue. But you do it in a sense of encouraging exhortation. Remember, we ought to reprove and rebuke. That's judging. You've got to make a judgment there if you're going to reprove, if you're going to rebuke. But again, you do it in love and you do it in a way to make things better, not to make things worse or to puff yourself up because you're better than they are. So again, with the Word of God, we have wisdom. With the Word of God, we can make judgments in a right way. We do a right thing in a right way. And the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the understanding and strength to be able to wield the Word of God to do just that. So again, don't do it with your own human right resources and power, but do it with the Word of God filled with God the Holy Spirit. This word also meant identification of one with another. It's kind of an interesting thing, you know, the appointment. And it had the sense of, you know, one individual appointing another for a role or a responsibility, like we have in our uh, judicial system in the United States. In some places, I know it's different in every state, but, you know, sometimes the elected officials appoint who is going to be a judge or who's going to be a secretary of state or who's going to do this or who's going to do that. There's an appointment, but there's also an identification of the one with the other. And in that sense, this fire is now being identified with the apostles. The flame of fire is setting upon their head. One is identified with the other. And when we see the flame and we see the apostles, we recognize that it's God identifying himself with the believer. And there's an appointment there, and there's an empowering, enabling ministry that God the Holy Spirit brings to the life of every believer. And again, that word authority comes into play as well. You have authority. Again, don't lose the fact of the authority that you have resident within your soul and that you've been appointed to. Remember, you're a royal priest. You're a royal ambassador. You are part of God's family. And you have authority in that sense, to wield that authority of the Word of God, to wield the authority of the gospel message, to wield the authority of re encouraging, reproving, and rebuking, to wield the authority of how to live the Christian way of life, how to wield the authority to overcome sin and Satan so that you're not overwhelmed by the cosmic system and the temptations of our sin nature. Wield that authority. You've got power to do that. And it's been given to you. It's been appointed to you. And the Holy Spirit is the one who enables you to do all that. Utilize it. Unfortunately, too many Christians in our day and age are not utilizing the power that God has given to them. And they're just going off on their own, making their own decisions from the human viewpoint or the viewpoint of, you know, someone else that has come along called Satan in his cosmic system. So again, wield the power and authority that God has given to you and don't be shy about it. Be strong, be committed, and stand firm. That's why we have the full armor of God. Again, as I said the other night, to with, withstand the flaming missiles or the flaming arrows of the evil one. And we have a full armor so that we don't have to be overcome by those things. Instead, we have authority and power to wield, to defeat sin and Satan in our lives. All right, so now as we move on to verse uh, uh, 4 uh, in chapter 2, now we see the aspect of the Holy Spirit represented in that flame coming into them and the impact that that had called the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And this is interesting that it's called filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to explain that to you in just a minute. 
But again, let's read verse 4. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So as it says, the Spirit giving them utterance. We're going to come back and talk about that a little bit later on after we go through some of these doctrines now of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But again, as he was giving them utterance. In other words, they all didn't go out and start to speak, you know, a, a French or a Spanish. That's what I should correct that because maybe they didn't speak French and Spanish back then. Akkadian or Ethiopian, okay, or, or uh, Macedonian. I don't know what the languages were back then, but those kind of languages, okay. So they were able to speak those languages that they never spoke before. But they all weren't speaking the same language. They all were speaking a different language. And they were going off to the people of the 3,000 men that were gathered. Those from Acacia, they were speaking Acadian. Those from Macedonia, they were speaking Macedonian, okay? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, they were all speaking in different languages to the audience that they were addressing. And that audience was full aware of what they were saying. But yet the people that were next to them that didn't know Acacia or Acadian or Macedonian or Greek or whatever the case may be, if they didn't know that language, they thought they were just talking gibberish. And that's why they said, oh, they must be drunk, okay, as we've talked about. All right. So in any case, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit then appointed which one would have the authority to speak that language versus this language. And they were given that a power and authority, and they wielded that power and authority that very day. To great effect, where they saved 3,000 people, men that had come into the city of Jerusalem. But let's get into the filling part, because that's interesting here. Because the word fulfilled in this passage is the word pletho, and it means to be filled or completed. So they were completed with the Holy Spirit, but we say they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, the Holy Spirit now came into them. He had his indwelling ministry within them. And not only was he indwelling them, but he was operating and functioning within them at that very moment. And what we recognize, we're going to get into this in just a little bit, but there's a difference between the indwelling and the filling. Okay? Two different things. All right? But one goes with the other. You see, in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which means he's functioning and operating within you, you need to be dwelled with the Holy Spirit. Indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Did I say that right? Okay. You have to have the indwelling first, and then with the indwelling, you can be filled. But the filling, oh, excuse me, let me go back. The indwelling, you never lose that. And it'll be with you the rest of your life while you're here on planet Earth. That's part of our positional sanctification, our eternal security that we are indwelt. But the filling, that can come and go. And again, when we are indwelt instantaneously, we're filled because, again, we've been cleansed of all the sins up until that point in time, as we know, experientially, and we're automatically filled right away. But the first time we sin after that point of our salvation, that filling goes away. And again, the indwelling's still there, but now we've supplanted the Holy Spirit filling within us and now we're being led by sin and sin is in control rather than the holy spirit but as god has given us first john 1 9 we confess our sins cleansed of all unrighteousness that sin then is washed away and we are filled with the holy spirit once again and now he is functioning and operating and leading our soul rather than our sin nature So what we see here is that instantaneously it says they were filled with the Spirit. Well, yes, at the moment of our salvation, the indwelling comes, as we've seen the flame of fire. That's also synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, even though there's some other things that happened with the baptism. But instantaneously you are filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment because of the cleansing process that occurred and the indwelling of the Spirit. Now he's functioning and operating within your soul. And he will remain that way until you sin. Okay? So that's what happened with these individuals. They were indwelt and immediately filled, pletho, with the Holy Spirit. We're going to see a synonymous word that also is used throughout the New Testament for being filled with the Spirit. And it's a cognate word. It's pleroo. All right? But again, it means similar things. But it's talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, which talks about the empowering, enabling Holy Spirit working within your soul. 
Now, when we see this word pletho, it's interesting. I'm going to give you some of the first times that it's used, and it's only used up until the book of Acts, okay? And then after that, we don't see it in the rest of the New Testament. But in the book, you know, from Matthew to Acts, we see it used a number of times. The first time it's used, interestingly enough, is in the parable of a marriage feast, okay? First time pletho, fill, 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 is used in a marriage feast. And it gives us an understanding of what the filling of God the Holy Spirit is intended for us to do. And that is found in Matthew chapter 22, verse 10. Now, you can go back and read the rest of the parable on your own, but the important passage and where that word is used is in verse 10, where it says, Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found. Now, what had happened is that there was a big wedding feast, and the master invited all these guests, but none of the guests showed up. They didn't want to come to the wedding feast. Who doesn't want to go to a wedding? Free food, dancing, drinks, good time. But apparently, they didn't want to come to this wedding feast, okay? So nobody came. And the master got angry and got mad because nobody accepted his invitation. He's talking about people rejecting the invitation of salvation to come to God's great marriage feast to Jesus Christ and that great wedding feast. All right, we're going to see that in a minute. But nobody wanted to come. So what does he say? He took his servants. He said, go out. And go out into the streets and gather anybody you can. And I love what it says, the evil and the good. You know, the self-righteous and the sinner. Okay? Again, both are categories of unbelievers, the evil and the good. Just gather them all together. And they did that. And what happened? The wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. So the ter- first time this word filled is used in the New Testament, it's talking about the gathering of believers and bringing them into the family of God and have, excuse me, having a great uh, marriage supper and wedding feast in celebration. So again, that's what the Holy Spirit is here to do through us. And that's what his ministry is all about as well. You see, the Holy Spirit's ministry is to, you know, one of the things is common and efficacious grace. Common grace, he teaches the gospel so it's understandable to the unbeliever. Efficacious grace, if they believe, he takes their faith and makes it effective for salvation. Now they are part of the wedding guests. They're there at the wedding feast. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Okay, So the first time that this word is used is the gathering together. And that's what God the Holy Spirit has done with you and I. You and I are the good and the evil that have been gathered together that are going to be in a great wedding hall one day at the marriage of the Lamb. And it's kind of a dual connotation because we're the ones getting married, but we're also at the wedding feast too. Okay, Great celebration. All right, But we're the good and the evil that the Holy Spirit has gathered together and ultimately now filling the wedding hall, having a great celebration. And part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to work through you so that now you can also give the gospel so that he can make it understandable to the soul of the unbeliever where they might believe upon it and then he'll take that and make it effective for their faith. So again, he is the one that's getting all the good and evil together to be part of this great wedding celebration that you and I are now part of because we have believed. So again, as I said, common and efficacious grace ministries of all the Holy Spirit. He makes the gospel understandable to the believer. And that's what he does under common grace. And then efficacious grace, he takes their faith and he makes it effective for their salvation. You see, that's why we say there's no works involved in our salvation whatsoever. Even our belief, which some people can claim, I did it, even that on our own, as an unbeliever, is not effective for our salvation by ourselves. But yet the Holy Spirit in grace takes our faith and says, okay, you've met the qualifications, boom, now I'm going to give you salvation. So again, we can't even save ourselves, but the Holy Spirit does it. So efficacious grace is that ministry of the Holy Spirit that makes our faith effective for salvation, where when then we become what? The bride of Christ. And that's who we are. Collectively, we're the bride of Christ. And we're going to be at that great wedding celebration in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, when we are married to our Lord and we are the bride, we will become his wife, but we will be part of that great uh, feast and celebration as well. 
And again, when it talks about the church age believer, it talks about us being that bride or that wife of Christ. And then it talks about a great uh, you know, feast of others that are invited as well. But even Jesus said John the Baptist was not the bride, but he was the invited guest. He was an invited guest, and how blessed he would be just to be there. So what does that tell us? Old Testament saints are the invited guests too, but they're not the bride as we are according to the Scriptures. So in any case, we see that in Revelation chapter 19. Let me show you those uh, verses. Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Again, Pletho, the room was filled. And God is going to fill up his, his, his uh, banquet hall with believers one day, even though those who were invited had rejected it. And when we even step back and look at this from a 20,000-foot level, it's even saying when he went to the Jews and said, here's your Messiah, and they rejected him. They were the initial guests invited who refused the invitation. Again, not all Jews, but as a, as, a, a, as a group and as a religion, they rejected the Messiah. Many of them became believers, as we know, and still do. Okay, That's part of the grace of the church age. But that group as a whole has rejected Jesus as their Messiah. They rejected the invitation. But you and I, the evil and the good, have accepted the invitation, and we have come into the marriage celebration as the bride, now to be the wife, but we're part of the celebration. Again, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Then we see in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, then he said, Right blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to them, These are true words of God. Again, first time pletho is used in the whole Bible, in the New Testament, we should say, is in regard to those that were invited to the marriage feast that rejected it, but the good and evil did accept it, and they were part of the wedding feast. And that's what we see, uh, the culmination of that after the at, uh, during the end of the tribulation when this marriage celebration will occur. Then later on in the book of Revelation, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And again, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And the church is called the bride of Christ. And we will be the wife of the Lamb in that eternal state. So again, we see the invitation that has been accepted. The Holy Spirit's indwelling ministry has given us entrance into the wedding banquet, the wedding hall. And then this one too, in Revelation twenty-two seventeen, 17, the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. So here we are at the end of the book of Revelation. And after all the things that have been said throughout the entire Bible, now culminated and closed with the book of Revelation, and all the understanding of the bride and the marriage celebration and the wedding feast, it then gives an exhortation as to what that bride should do. The Spirit and the bride say what? Come. God the Holy Spirit as the ministry of common and efficacious grace. Come, come, come. Come to the wedding feast. But we're also the bride. And the bride is there in lockstep with the Holy Spirit. And we too are to say what? Come, come, come. In other words, what are we to do? evangelize and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ and send out the invitation. That's our responsibility. And we do that in conjunction with God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the bride say come. And then again it goes on to say, and let all who hear say come. And again when it says hear, it means they've also accepted it and learned it and therefore come. And let the one who is thirsty come. The one who needs salvation and desires salvation, recognizes they're a sinner and they need a, a Savior, come. And let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Let that one come too. And again, there's no cost to salvation. It's free. It's a non-meritorious gift from God. All you have to say is, yes, I believe. And truly believe it. 
and it will be given to you. So again, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that began the church age on the day of Pentecost, he is also collecting those who would be part of the marriage celebration so that they too could then be empowered and enabled to call others to come to the feast. Notice how it said all the way back in Matthew, the slaves went out. And again, we could translate that servants. And you and I are the servants of God. Even though we're the bride of Christ, we're still servants. And we are charged to go out to the streets, the byways, the highways, the good and the evil, and give the gospel message. And we don't have to judge them for their lifestyle. We just have to give them the gospel message. We don't have to determine, are you good or are you evil? No. If they're good, give them the gospel. If they're evil, give them the gospel. No judgment. Just go do it and bring salvation and invite them. And then if they don't want to come, they don't want to come. But hopefully they will. And hopefully they'll accept that invitation and come to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Revelation 22, again, is that, that empowering, enabling ministry of our God, the Holy Spirit, working inside of us to evangelize and witness and go out and bring people in to the family of God. It's also interesting, a couple other examples. Pletho is used in Luke's Gospel. And the first time that it is used in Luke's Gospel is for John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And he's the one that paved the way. He said, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And when Jesus showed up, the Lamb of God that was slain, he pointed him out, the Lamb of God, there he is. He's the all-sufficient sacrifice necessary for our salvation. And John the Baptist was able to do that because he too was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know a lot of you know this already, but some may not. But remember, back in the Old Testament days, they didn't have the permanent indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, of every believer the way we do now. This is unique now to the church age, which began on what we're studying in the Feast of Pentecost. But prior to that, God only indwelled and filled a few individuals. And in this case, he did it with John the Baptist so that he could be empowered and enabled to carry out God's missionary for him and to fulfill execute God's plan for his life as the forerunner for Jesus Christ. And so this filling that he had is what we try to di differentiate a little bit by calling it the endowment of the Holy Spirit. Okay, And there's a Greek word, enduo, that it gives us that you know, technical word, as we call it. But again, it's very similar to what we have, but it wasn't a permanent thing. And they could lose the indwelling. And if they lost the indwelling, that means they didn't have the filling either didn't mean they couldn't execute the spiritual life, okay? But they just didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit to help execute that. But for a few individuals, it was given to them. And John the Baptist had it throughout his life because that was God's plan, and he knew that John would be positive and therefore accept the power and utilize that well in the plan that God had for his life. And so, as I said, the endowment of the Holy Spirit, again, is different from the permanent dwelling that all believers now have. And we, once we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we do not lose that indwelling. The filling aspect, we can lose it. But you can get it right back too through the confession of your sin, utilizing 1 John 1, 9. But in the Old Testament time frames, again, for some people it was permanent throughout their lives, but again, for others who did receive it, it kind of would it, sometimes it would come and sometimes it would go. And in fact, we see John the Baptist, mother and father. In Luke chapter 41, his mother Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spoke a great message. A little bit later on, in verse 66, his 67, his father Zacharias was filled with the Spirit, and he spoke a great message. But we also don't think that they remained or uh, uh, maintained that filling of the Holy Spirit because it wasn't a permanent thing for the Old Testament saints. But they were given to it, uh, they were uh, given it to be empowered during these few times. And in both times, we see great speeches that they both gave that are recorded in the Bible, which are now memorialized as God's truth for all of eternity because of the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, in John's gospel, he only uses it one time, and it's kind of interesting that the one time that he uses it is in regard to what we've already studied of when Jesus was crucified. When it was Jesus was crucified, remember, I am thirsty, I thirst. And when the soldier ran over, they got the, 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 uh, uh, the big spear that was made out of hyssop, good analogy there, dipped the sponge in sour wine, and they gave it to Jesus Christ to satisfy his thirst. Okay? And again, the hyssop branch was used in the, you know, the, uh, the rituals at the temple and the sprinkling of the blood. So again, that gave us a great picture of the completed work of Jesus Christ upon the cross where now he was able to receive the wine because he was the wine that was sacrificed or the shed blood for our sins. So again, both in John and then also in Matthew's last time that he uses this word in 2748, it's used for that sour wine that was offered to Jesus Christ while he was crucified. So this brings us the word pletho to the origin of why we're able to be filled with the Holy Spirit because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so all that empowering, enabling ministry that we are filled with is based on the completed work of Jesus Christ upon the cross as demonstrated not only by saying, Tetelestai, it is finished, but by receiving the sour wine because now the work was completed. And that was a great stamp on the completion of work as we studied that uh, most recently. Now we see some other applications, and this too is, I found, interesting. If you take the word pletho, and you look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, chapter 6, and in Acts 5, 17, and uh, uh, verse 13 and 45, it gives us the contrast of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because all of these applications talk about people being filled with something besides the Holy Spirit, which is, in the application, sin. So now we get the, the analogy. We can either be filled with sin or it can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, in these passages, they were filled with jealousy and anger, rage and bitterness. And you can go back and read those and see the context around it. So again, it talks about the filling of our soul. We could be filled with that or we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, we have to ask ourselves, what do I want to be filled with today and every day? Do you want to be filled with sin? and operate by sin, and have all the agita that comes with sin within your life? Or would you rather be filled with the Holy Spirit and have that strength and power and uh, 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 wisdom and judgment that is available to make good, wise decisions each and every day? And then, again, just to round it out, in the book of Acts, in those passages, we see it also being applied to other uh, b new believers, and also Peter, when he went out and uh, uh, spoke, and then Paul at his conversion. And at the day of Paul's conversion, just like the other apostles on the day of Pentecost, they were immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul, too, at his conversion, was immediately filled with God the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he in was indwelt, baptized by the Holy Spirit, and right away you're filled with the Spirit, and you remain that way, and as I said, until the next sin comes along. So again, we see this uh, filling, not just the apostles and disciples there on the day of Pentecost, but other believers that came beyond and after them. And so now we recognize throughout the entire church age, not only from these scriptures, but from others, that all church age believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and at, the, at that moment they are immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, as it also tells us in Ephesians 5.18, after our salvation, if we lose the filling of the Spirit, we can regain that back. Because in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we have that cognate word, pleroo. Okay? And that too means to be filled, to be complete, to make full, supply fully. Okay? And in Ephesians 5.18, what does it say? Do not get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation. We don't use that word too much anymore, being a waste of life. Don't get drunk with wine, for it's a waste of life, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, drunk with wine is just one example of the sin we could enter into. Okay? It's not just saying only wine. Okay? It's saying don't get involved in any sin. Why? Because it's a waste of life. But instead, the contrast, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like I gave you those verses previously, we could be filled with sin, like angry, uh, bitter, jealousy, 
and any other sin that can come along, or drunk with wine, as it says in Ephesians 5.18. We can do that, or we can be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And that is our choice. That's our choice. Nobody made you. Remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it, okay? No, the devil didn't make you do it. The devil might have tempted you to do it, but you decided to do it. It's your choice. And that's where we have to have positive volition to the things of God and say, you know, my choice is that I don't want to be filled with sin because I know what that brings along. I know what that, that results in. And again, we're all going to slip up. We're all going to have sin from time to time. But if we do, recognize it right away and correct the situation so that once again you are filled with God the Holy Spirit. So how do we uh, uh, solve that? And again, in your notes, I gave you a lot of detail. I didn't want to go through all that tonight. But in order to solve that sin problem, we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? So Ephesians 5, 18 don't be filled with sin. It's a waste of life, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we have sin, confess it, and we're cleansed of all unrighteousness experientially. And therefore, we get the filling of the Spirit once again. And if you really want to see the connection between those two passages, a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't mean, one doesn't mean the other. Yeah, it does. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 and read what comes in verses 1 through 17. Go to 1 John chapter 1. Read what's in verses 1 to verse 8, and then 10 as well that follows, okay? You'll see the same picture between Ephesians 5 and 1 John. Same type of words and verbiage. 1 John says it a little briefer. Ephesians gets into a little bit more detail. Same words, though, about fellowship, walking the light of Jesus Christ, or operating in sin. And so they both have the same context. And then in Ephesians, don't get drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you get involved in this stuff, confess those sins. So you know Ephesians 5, 18 and 1 John 1, 9 go together. And in order to remedy the sin problem, we have the confession of our sin. And again, 1 John 1, 9 is not the only passage that tells us we are cleansed and ultimately we should confess our sins. There are many others, both Old and New Testament. Another story for another day. But the filling that we're talking about here is filled with the Holy Spirit, hagios, and then we have the Greek word pneuma. Remember pneuma? We just talked about that in regard to the uh, previous word that we had for wind back in verse 2. The wind filled the room. And that was uh, no, P-N-O-E, cognate of pneuma, okay? Also means wind and breath, but pneuma also can mean spirit. And as we saw both of these words being utilized in the Old Testament, we see how they are synonymous types of terms. But when we see the word for the Holy Spirit, it's always the pneuma, hagias pneuma, hagias pneuma, in the New Testament Greek. So again, that's what we're to be filled with, filled with the Holy Spirit. And in regard to this, again, this is identified with the indwelling fire, the flame of fire that came into these individuals, the visible manifestation of the third person of the Trinity, that being God, the Holy Spirit, who indwelt these individuals and did for us at the moment of our salvation as well. So as we know, even though in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, we go back to Luke 24, 49, which is our main topic of study right now. We've been, it's been a while since we've been there, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been a long time, okay? But there's been a lot going on. A lot going on, people. A lot going on, okay? And it's been great, talking about Jesus and his post-resurrection appearances and all that. But in Luke 24, 49, he says, Stay in Jerusalem or stay here until you receive power on high. In Acts chapter 1, 5, stay here until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we're in Acts chapter 2, and we see this process of this flame, the wind, the fire, entering into them, and what does it say? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, even though right here it doesn't say they received power from on high, nor does it say they were baptized with God the Holy Spirit, this is the record of the fulfillment of those two prophecies that Jesus made. So we know that the filling 
of the Spirit. It's synonymous with the power from on high. So we know it's God, the Holy Spirit, that has come down, God's power that is now in us. And we also know it's the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. So again, we know that what, what this is all about. Okay, so we put these things together, just like, you know, Ephesians 5.18 goes with 1 John 1, nine. Okay, just like these three verses all go together. Even though they say different things, they all go together. They're just giving us different angles of viewpoint. So the filling of the Holy Spirit is the result of the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, which again, later on in the New Testament, we see the word indwelling, and that's where we get the Greek word endowment or enduo. Okay, and so we see the indwelling, okay, but it speaks of that empowering, enabling ministry of God the Holy Spirit that has been given to us that now we're able to utilize and apply. And it's given to us, and it's inside of us, okay? He resides inside of us. And again, another topic for another day, but so doesn't God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Because again, they're one God. So if God the Holy Spirit comes into us and they're one, Guess what? The other two are coming along too. Okay, <laughs> They're there too. But yet the emphasis is for the ministry of the Holy Spirit as far as the indwelling. But we're also told in the Bible that the Father and the Son also indwell us as well. You and me and I and you, as Jesus Christ said. But yet there's a difference, as I've already noted, and I won't go into a lot of detail again, between the filling and the indwelling. There's a difference, Okay. The filling is the aspect of the dwelling ministry where he is working and functioning and empowering you. Okay? But the indwelling is a separate thing because that's him residing inside of you. That's why it says, do you not know you're the temple of God? Because he resides in you. He's living in there right now. But the filling, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a choice. You can either do one or the other. You see, the indwelling never changes. You're always the temple of God, and God lives in you. But filled, sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. And it's that volitional responsibility of the filling. Did I sin or did I not? Did I confess the sin or did I not? Okay? So again, filling is different. The filling is temporary, can come and go, but we can always get it back. We can always get it back. Again, in the Old Testament... If they lost the indwelling of the Spirit, they would lose the filling of the Holy Spirit. They could lose both. But that didn't mean because they sinned either, okay? Sometimes maybe, okay? But in the Old Testament, it was just like, okay, I want to empower this guy to do the, or this woman to, to do this thing right now. And I'm going to indwell them and fill them right now. But once that work is done, they don't need my power. They can just operate on their own spiritual life in faith, Okay? So again, they wouldn't always be indwelled and filled. And, it, and they didn't lose it because they were bad. And at the same time, we see David saying, you know, you pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit to empower you and enable you. So they could pray for that too. And it would be an answer to their prayer if God saw that this was the right thing at the right time. So again, very interesting for the Old Testament saint, but very different for you and I. Because we're permanently indwelt, we do not lose that. And then the filling is our volitional responsibility as to whether we are going forward in the plan of God and have confessed our sins to receive God's cleansing so that we can go forward, or whether we do not. And for every believer at the moment of their salvation, Jesus and who have believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are indwelt, which means they are baptized by the Holy Spirit. And again, baptism synonymous but yet different there's other things i'm going to show you that uh, 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 uh upcoming not tonight but there's a whole other thing on baptism okay we'll talk about that and at the same time at the moment that we believe we are simultaneously filled with the spirit and they were on the day of pentecost and they came out of that room and all of a sudden they ran into three thousand men from jerusalem and as i said you know why were the 3,000 men all of a sudden around where they were, okay? Didn't make it seem like they traveled to the temple to find these people and then stopped witnessing. It just said they went out of the room and they started witnessing and speaking in other languages. 
And as I said on uh, Tuesday night, probably because of the sound of the rushing wind. They probably heard a great thunderous roar of a rushing, oncoming army. And they, then they went to the place. Where'd that come from? And they ended up at the disciples' door. And the disciples came out and ultimately began to witness. Yet, as we know from Ephesians 5.18, we can lose the filling of the Holy Spirit if we enter into sin. Okay? Plain and simple. But the indwelling does not go away. Ephesians 5.18, as I said, do not get drunk with wine, for that is a waste of life, dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And on this day of Pentecost, the disciples heard and saw this manifestation of the Holy, or the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. They heard the wind. They might have felt it too. Maybe there was a little blowback by the wind. But, but as it's described, they heard the rushing wind. And then they saw the tongues of fire resting on each one of their heads. And then they knew that the Spirit was there because now they were able to go out and speak in these languages that they never spoke before. Nor did they learn those languages. It just came naturally by the power of the Holy Spirit. And immediately they knew they were filled with the Spirit. So again, as we come back on uh, uh, Sunday, I guess I'll be our next service, is uh, on Sunday, now we're going to start talking a little bit more about the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, and what that means. And when we finish that, then we'll get to the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, and what that means for us in the church age as well. All right, so let's uh, close this evening. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your spirit that has empowered us and enabled us to do your will and to do your work. And Father, we just ask that you help us to uh, understand and realize this indwelling ministry of your spirit more and more each and every day so that we gain confidence in it, we trust and rely upon it, and we utilize it rather than using our own human resources and power and strength. And instead, trust in you for all things as we ultimately glorify you. Father, we ask for travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.